Ja, okay. Yeah, if there are more participants, I can't really ask each one of you to introduce each other. But uh, yeah, I'll just wait for another one or two minutes before I uh, start with the session. So my name is Senji Lakshmi. Uh, you guys can call me Senji. I'm a PhD student at Indian Institute of Science. Uh, I am a course member for this uh, program. So I'll I'll mostly having these uh, sessions to clarify doubts. I hope all of you can understand English. Uh, if you have any doubts, you can ask me in the chat box. You can type it in Hindi as well. I can try responding my spoken hindi is not that good so i'll i'll try to speak in english and hope that everyone understands uh yeah so this is going to be more like an interactive session i also have a couple of slides where i'll just go over some of the concepts that are dealt with in the sessions so as you all know in this NPTEL course you'll have weekly lectures uh, each week you'll have lecture content uh, for four or five hours and then you just have to go through them and you'll have assignments to do so uh, i'll also be uh, whatever that i'm teaching now will also help you in solving some of those assignments uh, the questions are very basic if you just go over the course content you'll be able to understand them uh, in case there are any particular doubts in the assignments that you're not able to solve you can always ask me you can type it in the chat box unmute yourself and talk you can switch on your videos this is this is just more like an interaction i'm also just like you i was also one of the students who took the course and now i'm here uh, as in course um, um, uh, ta uh, i'll share the presentation screen now and uh, if more people join i'll i'll accept them as they join uh, all right Um, this is my first session, so I'm, I'm also kind of not sure. And my kind request would be for people to join before six five max, so that I have I also have to parallelly record these sessions. So these session recordings will also be available on YouTube, uh, in case you have missed the session or if you have friends who are also taking the course but have not been able to join the session, you can always. Um, ask them to uh, check the links, the YouTube links. Um, you can also post your questions in those YouTube videos or uh, in the discussion um, uh, forum that's there in the course itself. All right. Uh, okay, there's still okay. one more minute. I'll probably wait max up to 6.5 and then start sharing my screen for the presentation. In the meanwhile, if anyone has anything to say, anything to ask, please feel free to mute and speak. Anyone who's not comfortable with English, you can say that as well. All right, it's 6.5. I'm going to share my screen and I assume everyone's able to hear me and my audio and everything is clear. In case it's not, please do let me know. When I'm sharing the screen, I might not be able to see the chat box. So please do unmute 
and ask your questions and please try to make it as interactive as possible all right uh could someone please confirm if if my screen's visible in full screen mode yeah it's visible only yeah awesome thank you so much uh, yeah, again, my name is Senji. Uh, I am a PMRF scholar. So PMRF is a fellowship for PhD students. Uh, okay, there's someone else. I'm not sure how to stop this anyway. Yeah, it's still visible, right? Yes, it's visible. Yes, yeah, sorry. Uh, yeah, PMRF is a fellowship given for PhD students um, um, and I am from Indian Institute of Science. Uh, this is our first session. So let's, I mean, a little bit about me. I'm working at Evolutionary Venomics Lab. Uh, I do evolution and I study venoms. My research topic is snake venoms. I am trying to understand how venoms change. Um, what are all the different things in snake venoms and what makes snake venom so scary. Uh, if I get time, uh, sometime during these sessions, I'll talk a little bit more about my own research as well, if that interests you guys. But I'm basically a biotechnologist. I did my BTEC uh, from Anna University, Chennai. Um, um, I'm in the 2014-2018 batch. Uh, okay, this is going to be an issue. People keep joining late. Uh, all right yeah i'll figure out a solution for that uh yeah anyway so i did industrial biotechnology and then i switched to studying snake venoms um which is completely very far away from biotechnology but i still have my roots in biotechnology so that's why um, to you guys i'm gonna be uh, teaching a little bit of environmental biotechnology uh this was one of those courses where you can just uh you know write everything that you see in the news and and what you read about climate change everything and still score a lot of marks it's, it was such a cool subject and that's also why it's one of my favorite subjects too um and i'm happy you guys are doing this nptel course and and that i got to interact with you guys uh through this opportunity provided by nptel uh yeah like i said i want this to be more interactive so can some of you speak up about what are your thoughts about what is this course? How many of you are doing it for like the first time? This is like your first ever NPTEL course or what are your expectations from this course? Can any one person say, even if it's just two, one or two lines, it's still okay. Yeah, good evening. My name is Arul Kumaran. I am doing this first time in this course. Awesome. Uh, but, uh, I just joined because of uh, my research work. I, I joined as a part-time PhD. Okay. So because of that, I'm doing this work. Uh, I joined the NPTEL courses. But I'm feeling it is giving you more informative on uh, the field which I want to learn more. Okay. Okay. Awesome. Hopefully, doing well. And that, uh, experiences from the others will also make me improve my work or related to or this knowledge about this field. That's, that's great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, anyone else wants to quickly talk about your expectations or why are you here? Uh, yes, ma'am. Good evening. I'm Lavanya. Yeah. Hi. Uh, I'm doing my YouTube. You don't have to call me, ma'am. All of you just call me, Senji. Uh, yeah. Yeah, right, uh, I'm doing my UG. Uh, this is my third year. That's final with BSc Botany Chemistry with Zoology. And actually, I've thought of uh, pursuing my PG with Biotech. So I opted to do with environmental Biotech. Just a little course. This is my first time also. That's that's great. That's awesome. Um, OK, fine. So many of you are, so I assume, are either from the Biotech background itself or aspiring uh, to uh, you know do courses in the biotech field so yeah so that is what this course is going to be about biotech but also about the environment uh, environment is a word that comes from a french word uh, and we're on okay this is kind of disturbing okay I'm, I'm again telling people please try to join by 
like six five max so that I don't have to every time keep switching between admitting people and so on. I'll try to find out if there's a solution to just let everyone in without having to admit. But please try to join uh, before uh, six five so that I finish all this admitting uh, before I actually start the session so that others also don't get disappointed. Okay, oh my God. Okay. Yes. So the word means to encircle everything that's in our surroundings. You, me, the plants, animals, everything that's there around us is included in the environment. And the word biotechnology. Biotechnology is, is the technology that exploits biological products or organisms for the benefit of mankind. So anything that involves biological organisms uh, and how to study them, how to use them for develop better products is what encompasses biotechnology. So what is the study that when both of these terms come together about environment and biotechnology? So this is just a brief timeline of what happened in the field of biotechnology. Uh, even though the term biotechnology itself was coined much later on, uh, somewhere around the 1800s, people started doing biotechnology much, much before. Even before there were literatures, books or anything, people started doing uh, stuff that were related to biotechnology. Anything as simple as fermenting, uh, stuff like you know even in in our own uh, culinary arts there's fermenting food like idli and dosa all of those were biotechnology in in their own form but it was just never called as a proper science or technology but later on it evolved and then we have uh, uh, genes that have been discovered dna uh, structure was discovered the term genetic engineering was coiled and and people started modifying genes um, and then we also have this this whole uh, um, um, genetic engineering field evolving uh, where we can manipulate genes and and modify organisms which gave us an edge um, uh, over manipulating systems so that's where it all started and then uh, now we have uh, uh, rice that is modified genetically modified organisms plants so many things that we can imagine and a lot of things that we use in our day-to-day -day life uh, comes from uh, the uh, applications of biotechnology and it is still growing and, and there are a lot more applications to it and one such growing application is using the information from uh, genes and genetic engineering uh, uh, into data sciences to develop uh, a better lifestyle for humans again yeah but uh, even though there are a lot of these things that we do to make our lifestyle better uh, there are also things that are damaging the environment that we live in the world that we live in is slowly dying and there are a lot of uh, challenges that is there in in the current scenario um, can someone say something that comes to their mind when we think about environmental challenges that are currently there one or two people Pol pollution from global warming yes global warming correct waste water treatment yes awesome animal pollution uh, living places sorry Many animals moving into the uh, living spaces of humans yes uh, like snakes or elephants yes yes right yeah so uh, depletion of uh, uh, natural habitats which is causing the yeah. they're raising their natural habitat yes awesome all all of you are, are right these are all many of these are major challenges many of this comes under this umbrella term called climate change which is the main root cause for many of these problems lot of diseases are coming like we saw covid and then immediately before even covid even got over we are having monkeypox and in the past couple of decades we have had lot of diseases emerging newly ebola and different forms of sars viruses and so on <clears throat> okay And also increasing energy needs, like we are depleting all our fossil fuels, we don't have enough uh, energy for uh, electricity, the electricity bill 
just keeps increasing in price the fuel prices keep increasing all of this is because we don't have enough resources and all of this combined together is because of population explosion the human population has grown to such high numbers in the past few decades which is also one of the reason why many of these problems have also grown uh, over the years we have a lot of people to serve the resources food fossil fuel everything is increasing and and the main reason is population explosion so these are some of the things that environmental biotechnology tries to address biotechnology as a whole tries to help humans help to uh, 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 treat humans in a better way that is where the medical applications of biotechnology come in genetic engineering development of antibodies and steroids and insulin insulin was a major discovery in biotechnology that changed uh, uh, the lifestyle of many diabetic patients and there's also agricultural biotechnology and even food biotechnology we're seeing a lot of food innovations uh, the way fermentation is done the the way alcohol is made all of these are some of the conventional applications of biotechnology but specifically environmental biotechnology looks at uh, these problems that are associated uh, with the way humans interact with the environment and making these uh, better uh, decontamination of environmental components we pollute almost every component of the environment water is polluted one of you mentioned about wastewater management um, air is polluted even soil is polluted um, and there are also uh, uh, waste minimization uh, uh, things that can be done rather than uh, treating the waste that is already generated we can have protocols to minimize waste and and that those are some of the things that environmental biotechnology focuses on and another important thing is I also have um, um, these um, references that I've mentioned in these slides. So these slides, you can see them on uh, YouTube. You, these videos will be available on YouTube. And these references, you can just type those references and get them uh, from Google and read more about these things that I'm trying to say. So if you are someone uh, who is doing some particular project on, on some of these things that we're discussing, you can go back to these papers and refer those papers to get more information and if you have any doubts, you can always come back and talk to me. Oh God, people are still joining. Anyway. Yes, so uh, this session is just going to be an overview of the different things that this course will focus on. Uh, obviously, you can get more information from the actual uh, lectures itself but these are some of the things that that we will touch upon over the course of the time and also there are I've made the slides in such a way that it will also help you in in answering some of the questions in your assignments uh, waste management so for us as a community the need of the R is to have a zero waste community where we generate less of waste treat our waste better uh, produce things in a much cleaner way so that we don't pollute the different components of the environment. So this is one of the major uh, uh, goals of any community and all the countries have uh, signed treaties to work towards better uh, um, uh, communities, especially uh, in terms of the carbon footprints, etc. So even our country has entered treaties with multiple nations where we have pledged to reduce the carbon footprint uh, by around 50% uh, in the next coming few years. Uh, but if we classify waste as biodegradable and non-biodegradable waste, uh, we will be able to understand what is the magnitude of waste management problem that we are looking at. Biodegradable waste, as you all will know from your preliminary school classes, that it's anything that can be degraded by natural processes. And on the other side, non-biodegradable is something that can't be degraded by natural processes. So non-biodegradable waste can either be recycled, but most of the times what happens is they end up in this kind of landfills where it's a mixed waste of both biodegradable, non-degradable, and they just stay um, uh, in the environment forever. Biodegradable pollutants are not just pollutants of biological origin, but any pollutant that can be converted into a non hazardous product non hazardous i mean it does not pollute any of the water resources or air or soil uh, and it can be absorbed by these without causing any harm uh, to the uh, biological organisms in in these uh, different components of the environment 
this pollutants can be broken down either by chemical treatment or by microorganisms and uh, microorganisms can use these substances even as an energy source so that they can uh, produce alternate energy from these uh, uh, products that are being broken down so those are biodegradable pollutants uh, so we'll take a case study to understand non-biodegradable pollutants a little more so anything that cannot be broken down uh, into components that are non-hazardous are non-biodegradable pollutants or organic pollutants that stay uh, uh, in the uh, environment for a longer period of time so arsenic is one such example it's a metal uh, it is not degraded by microorganisms or any of the chemical processes and the source for arsenic is several anthropogenic factors like industry emission of uh, fertilizers and pesticides that people use in their farm and it also comes from natural sources like volcanic eruptions and forest fires and uh, these just go to the air they mix in the air and then they come back as rain and mix with our water resources so our water resources start getting polluted by arsenic and that's how the arsenic cycle goes on because this water is then consumed by humans or by animals or it is used for uh, growing plants and they just keep cycling in the environment several countries across the world are having a serious issue because of arsenic pollution and as you can see here the bigger the size of the red dot it means that the more is the problem uh, of arsenic pollution in that particular country across the world and as you can see many of the uh, countries in this belt especially the tropical countries having are having a major issue because of arsenic and and this is concentrated in india as well and if we zoom in a little bit and see specifically in india you can see that along the gangetic plain uh seriously people are joining even now okay yeah uh, majorly across the gangetic plain we can see that there's a serious issue the number of dots here again represent each of the regions that are affected and most of the uh, states in india are affected only couple of states are actually unaffected uh, by arsenic pollution and uh, this is an overlay of the biogeographic zone of india uh, the different biogeographic zones including uh, the alluvial soils and deccan traps etc are, are shown in this map and as you can see it's mostly the alluvial soil which is considered as a very fertile ground for growing crops is what is completely polluted with arsenic and this also causes a lot of uh, problems to humans people get long-term um, uh, diseases that that uh, long-term disabilities uh, because of uh, drinking arsenic polluted water or living for a longer period of time in, in regions that are polluted with arsenic so what are the mitigation factors uh, for for this kind of pollutants that stay um, in the ground or stay in our system forever so what are all some of the mitigation strategies the first thing is to reduce uh, uh, releasing these harmful uh, uh, chemicals directly into the environment by effective waste management and the second thing is reducing the emu emission of greenhouse gases again uh, most of this is uh, uh, involves the treatment before they are being released and greenhouse gases uh, uh, should be completely reduced and alternative sources of energy should be sought out so that we can reduce the emission of greenhouse gases uh, decreasing the depletion of fossil fuels and of course uh, uh, here also it is again about exploring alternative energy um, i mean anything else that you guys can think of you guys can just um, just you know pitch in and, and give your ideas uh, you can drop it in the comments as well so one such mitigation strategy that uh, that biotechnology has given us is superbug so has anyone ever heard about this term superbug? someone who's in biotech someone who has done these courses in college anyone yeah someone's unmuted you can tell your name and 
again, I told you, uh, they want to create a, uh, a bacteria or whatever it may be, that organism which has to be utilized this or whatever polluted materials and degraded it into the uh, organic compounds like water or carbon dioxide. Yes. This is what they want to do with a super bug. Yes. Like, yes. Yeah. It was my previous idea when I finished my embassy in 2001. I have a bit more senior. Okay. At that time, they didn't listen. After 20 years of time, we have created a, uh, it was my plastic degradation. But still, that right now it's coming to the uh, reality. Yes. So, started right now. Yes, sir. It's yeah. taken 20 years. Uh, okay. Sir, could you please introduce yourself and, and tell your name and what you're doing? I attended uh, my embassy in microbiology and technology from Madurai Kamaraj University. I was working as a lecturer in uh, Badia University for one year. And then I died in IAC for research also over here in biochemistry. I was working in the professor area now. Oh, amazing. And I quit my job. I was not much interested in the research and teaching. I died in marketing. Right now, doing my uh, PhD work in Bharati University in Chennai. Amazing. Okay. 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 Thank you. So thanks for thanks for joining and thanks for sharing your thoughts. Uh, yeah, that's that's exactly what a superbug is. Uh, a superbug was uh, uh, designed by Professor Anand Mogul Chakrabarti. Um, okay. Yeah. Uh, so this is a strain of bacteria, Pseudomonas cutida. Uh, this bug was, uh, this bacteria was designed, this strain of bacteria was, uh, so this was an actual strain of bacteria, but it was tweaked using genetic engineering principles uh, uh, to make it digest oil and clean up oil spills. Oil spills is a major issue. Again, this is also another pollutant that pollutes water resources and just stays there forever. Uh, the oil settles on the top of the uh, oceans, thereby preventing uh, uh, the movement of sunlight and air between uh, the oil layer and the uh, water layer. And all the aquatic organisms that live uh, in the oceans actually suffer a lot because of this oil settling uh, in the oceans. So this uh, superbug, this bacterial strain was designed so that it can chew up the oil molecules and it produces something that's um, that's actually safe for the environment. That's a component that is not harmful. It breaks down into smaller uh, portions of molecules uh, so that it can be cleared uh, uh, from the system uh, and thereby uh, help in, in maintaining um, or um, uh, mitigating oil spills that has actually already happened. So this is one example where biotechnology has played a major role uh, in, in containing the pollution or managing uh, the waste in the environment. But why use microbes? Um, why not plants or why not animal products? Why use microbes? Uh, microbial biotechnology uh, as a field has grown so much and has uh, has played has has applications in uh, many other fields of biotechnology mainly because um, microbes are known to effectively manage biotic stress and abiotic stress um, uh, in case of uh, um, um, abiotic stress conditions like uh, um, unfavorable temperature or weather conditions uh, many of the microorganisms can actually go into a dormant stage Microorganisms also reproduce asexually, so they don't have to uh, wait for suitable conditions to reproduce when, when everything is, is uh, in good condition, when they have nutrients available and um, uh, sunlight and everything available, they can reproduce asexually. Uh, so they are able to manage biotic and abiotic stresses better. Uh, they are also, their genomes are uh, small in size, they can multiply faster, they can grow faster, the growth rate is higher. So you can look at multiple generations quickly you can tweak their genomes modify their genes they also have a lot of genetic components that help us in tweaking these crispr cas is is also a, a, a mechanism through which you can modify the genes and microbes can also be modified that way uh, they can help in bioremediation uh, they can uh, help in degrading organic matter and use that for alternative sources of energy. Uh, they are natural in origin, so they do not leave any harmful products behind when they are used in treatment. For example, like the pseudomonas, when we treat it with pseudomonas, there is no harmful uh, uh, effect after effect of using them uh, for bioremediation. 
they can also be tweaked in such a way that the harmful portion, the virulent portion or the infective portion can be removed and the rest can be used for actual modification. So, and they also help in nitrogen fixation, increase nutrient uptake uh, with the help of their metabolism. So these are some of the reasons why microbes have taken the main seat in biotechnology uh, for development of uh, various applications. They are cost effective. Like I said, um, they can be grown at a very small cost. Their nutrient requirement is much lesser compared to that of mammalian cells or plant cells. They grow fast because of their generation time is smaller. You can look at multiple generations. You can tweak generations and look at them um, uh, pretty quickly. Uh, the process is pretty, uh, pretty flexible. You can modify them and, and try to play around with their metabolism pretty quickly. The manipulation capacity, they are eco-friendly. Like I said, they do not leave harmful products behind. And they are also major players in most of the geochemical cycles. We will uh, look at geochemical cycles in little detail. You will also have those in the lecture slides as well. Uh, but to summarize the different applications that we look at for environmental biotechnology. Uh, it focuses on minimizing the production time, waste management, pollution control, energy crisis mitigation and sustainability. Biodegradable pollutants are readily degraded by microbial action or chemical action into non-harmful products. That's one of the reasons uh, we look at uh, uh, environmental biotechnology based applications. Persistent organic pollutants like the ones I mentioned, arsenic, chlorofluorocarbons, chromium, iron, these are toxic and they are fated to life. And these are some of the things that actually need to be taken care of. And microbes like superbugs can degrade these pollutants through reduction oxidation reactions and hence they are valuable for pollution control. Uh, so after this, I'll, I'll go a little bit and talk about uh, the microbial ecology. So if you have any doubts, questions or any suggestions or some points that you want to mention, please, please do mention now um, and then I'll go to the second part. And for people who joined after I started the session, my name is Senji Lakshmi. I'm a PMRF fellow. Um, I'll be the TA for this course. I'll be going over some of uh, the important discussion points and then what is this course is about, the different highlights from each week's lecture and so on. And please, please, a kind request, kindly join the session by 6.5 at least, uh, 6 o'clock, 6.5 at least, so that um, uh, I can continue with the sessions without having to break in between for, um, you know, admitting people uh, in the session. And all of these sessions are recorded and they'll be available on YouTube. So you can always um, check the sessions on YouTube. Okay. Uh, so the next thing, uh, we'll talk a little bit about ecosystems. But yeah, again, if anyone wants to say something, please, please do give your suggestions or comments. Okay. Uh, okay, I think there's no comments. Let me move forward. Uh, ecosystems. So when we talk about environments, it's important to understand the role of different components in the ecosystem uh, so that we'll be able to manage them better. Uh, so what do you think the word ecosystem means? Anyone can just just say whatever they think it is. Someone, hello. I'm still audible, right? It's up, yes. Yeah, okay, thanks for confirming. Uh, yes, the word ecosystem, again, uh, means everything but this unlike environment this is an organizational structure uh, from one to the other so in an ecosystem the most basic unit is a gene uh, there's this book called selfish gene which i would suggest all of you to go back and read it's an amazing book which explains how a gene it 
it's it has its own uh, thought process it propagates itself uh, it has a life cycle of itself uh, a gene is a very basic unit in our uh, dna in our it's it's a nucleotide sequence uh, you can look at uh, look about this more in molecular biology uh, where you have dna rna and proteins and all the information to produce anything and everything in biology comes from the dna information the genetic information which is stored in each of our cells and a gene is there in our genome it is there in every cell and these genes are what that decides what you are what you become what you do whether you are a plant or whether you are a microbe whether you are an animal or anything so gene forms the basic uh, unit in an ecosystem and followed by that is a cell all the genes are present together in the chromosomes in the genome inside a cell every single cell performs its own actions all the actions that the cell needs to do like uh, producing proteins um, excretion um, um, taking nutrients breaking down nutrients all of this anything that you can imagine an organism doing like eating digesting uh, moving growing all of this is actually done by a cell as well so every individual cell in your body is doing all of this and they all come together to form tissues uh, cellular organization is a tissue like muscles and so on and they combine together to form an organ like heart kidney liver all of these are organs that are combined with multiple tissues like connective tissues cardiac tissues and so on and that forms an organ system all the organs together and that together forms an organism as a whole and this organizational structure is valid for every uh, organism biological organism that you can think of uh, uh, from a small microbe uh, to a human this organization structure holds true and multiple organisms of a particular species come together to form a population uh, humans let's say uh, in india we are a population like likewise you can say this for any species of animal a bird uh, that is found in particular locality i am in bangalore so any particular bird that's found only in bangalore that species forms a population of species and these different populations of different species or different organisms come together to form an ecosystem and there are different types of ecosystem like marine ecosystem terrestrial ecosystem uh, coastal ecosystem and so on in coastal ecosystem you will find uh, um, uh, the animals that live uh, in the water and the plants that grow near water resources and so on so this is uh, a visual representation of how an ecosystem would look like and any component in that ecosystem is interconnected with every other component uh, so that's the major point of an ecosystem uh, it may be the abiotic resources such as uh, nutrients uh, the solar radiations moisture content the humidity content and so on or let it be the plant community soil microorganisms animals all of them come together and interact with one another in an ecosystem the biotic and the abiotic factors interact together to form an ecosystem so yeah so this is just how a food pyramid works uh, so we have the abiotic resources like sunlight water and um, the soil nutrients which form the primary resources uh, the primary producers which are usually plants they take in these resources and use these resources to convert them into energy which gets transferred uh, to different uh, levels or organizational structures so herbivores mostly insects they feed on uh, plants and they carry this um, uh, nutrient as well as the energy forward in the cycle and then comes the primary carnivore uh, rodents and and things that feed on these insects and then there's the um, secondary carnivore sorry for the error this is a secondary carnivore i'll get that fixed so a secondary carnivore is a snake or anything that feeds um, on the uh, predators of insects and then there's the apex predator on the top apex predator is a predator which does not have any other organism 
predating on this. So uh, something like an eagle uh, does not have any natural predators. They they are on the top of the uh, food chain. So the nutrients and the energy get transferred across the cycle in this way. And once the apex predator dies because of natural causes, the microbes in the soil decompose the energy uh, and the nutrients that is stored in the body of the apex predator and gives back all the nutrients back to the soil. So when, when uh, an, an organism dies, the body is uh, decomposed and broken down into carbon, nitrogen, um, uh, the different minerals. So we have bones in our body that uh, uh, has calcium. So these macro and micronutrients in the body of the organism gets broken down into their natural form and recycled back by these microorganisms to the soil. So only then the cycle becomes complete. So that also again emphasizes the role of microbes in this whole process. So this cycle is called as a nutrient cycle and energy diminishes across this whole cycle and does not get transferred back but nutrients get recycled back. So in this whole process uh, whatever the energy that is being received uh, uh, by the plants from the sunlight keeps on reducing lesser and lesser and in the end when the apex predator dies the energy diminishes. However, the nutrients that are saved across these different organisms will again go back to the soil. So this is like this is how the pyramid looks like. So the bottom of the pyramid uh, has the producers, which are the plants. They are also more in numbers. So as the pyramid goes above and above, the total number of organisms or the uh, individuals, total number of individuals in this will also go down. So if you take any ecosystem or environment, there will be more producers. But what is happening in the current times is that we're just cutting down trees. We don't have enough uh, green cover. We are reducing the number of producers. And that is the first step where the energy from the sun or water is getting converted uh, into uh, nutrients and energy. So if we keep on cutting down trees, that very first step itself is getting affected. The second step is consumers. These are the primary, secondary, and tertiary consumers. All of them come in this uh, um, um, base of the pyramid in, in this part of the pyramid um, and then on the top are the apex predators. Humans all also are in a way now in apex predators because we don't have any natural predators because of the way our lifestyle is. Uh, we don't live with any of the apex predators like lions or tigers anymore. So there isn't anything that, that can actually kill us other than the natural causes. So we are we occupy the uh, top of the pyramid uh, because of our lifestyle. But the energy, like I said, uh, um, across this goes down. Uh, the population density is higher in the bottom. Nutrient is higher. Energy is also higher. So as we go above the pyramid, uh, all of this starts diminishing. Uh, so that is actually most of what I have. So the last 10 minutes or something we can use uh, for more discussions and clarifications. So in brief, ecosystem encompasses everything, the biotic and abiotic components. Uh, this course will deal with each of these components and more importantly, microbes, because like you saw, those form the most important part because they are the ones that complete this whole nutrient cycle. So if you remove microbes from the equation, uh, whatever is decaying will never go back in the right form to the soil and we will never have plants growing back again. So we will look at more about microbes, the microbial ecology, uh, their role in biogeochemical cycles and so on in the next coming sessions. Uh, every session will be in the same time, six to seven, and the same things apply. I'll, I'll have the recordings posted on YouTube. Uh, yeah, the energy components, uh, uh, they, they all interact with one another, resulting in the transfer of energy and nutrients and energy diminishes, but nutrients do get cycled. Microbes play an essential role in completing the ecosystem. So that's pretty much what I have as the set of slides that I made. Uh, we can use the rest of the sessions for um, actual interactions, questions, and what else do you expect from, from these sessions? So I can make my slides in such a way that I cater 
uh, to the needs of the actual people taking the courses. Thank you so much for attending the sessions. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. But yeah, if you guys have any questions, any suggestions, please do let me know. Sanji, uh, it's uh, a look like overall uh, uh, product. Whatever, whatever you want to say that is overall. If you go for any specific section, like uh, if you, like if you go for recycling or degrading, uh, the sessions goes a little deeper. Uh, everybody will come to that chat, right? Yes. So uh, this was just the first session, so I just wanted yeah, to. I had, uh, yeah. Yes. The suggestion only. Uh, and, and these were also designed in, in line with the actual course material. So I don't want to uh, give out information that is not uh, in that particular week. So these are uh, uh, designed in such a way that whatever you're learning for that particular week will also be there in these slides. And mostly these are the things that are there in your assignment questions. So if you have uh, uh, any doubts while solving those assignment questions, you can, you can ask me and we can solve those Together, we can uh, look at some of those concepts again in case uh, you have doubts in those concepts. So yeah, definitely we'll be discussing further about some of these concepts in detail. Okay, thank you. Thank Yeah, so for people who joined, the, okay, where are the assignment questions? The assignment questions will be there in, in your NPTEL portal itself, wherever your lecture, you're taking those lectures, okay, people are still joining. Okay, strictly this is a six to seven session, so I'll start exactly at six and I will finish uh, by seven. I can extend it a little more if you have questions or want any specific topics to discuss. I would also um, um, kindly ask you guys to post uh, the things that you have doubts about so that I can also make uh, relevant material and, and teach about those things in the next class. So if you have any uh, doubts from your first week lecture material that you have gone through in the NPTEL website, please do post them here. I'll have the answers and the presentation slide in the next uh, session and we can discuss those particular concepts in detail. Uh, but yeah, this is between six to seven. So I, I will start exactly at six and finish by seven. If you have missed the session, you want to still see the session available uh, in in the uh, uh, YouTube link, you can always uh, go to the, go to my YouTube channel and you can. OK, may I know the name of the YouTube channel? Yes. Um, just give me a second. I can do that. Yeah, so this is a, a, a first session that I have made. So you can just type my name and that's those are the only videos that are available on my playlist. So you can just uh, record them. So I'm just putting my name here. You can just copy paste and just get this. Yeah, so that's my name and you just can go look at the playlist. They are kept. Uh, the visibility is public, so you can always go and check. But I'll also post the links to each of these sessions. I'll. Uh, check how I can send this to all of you. Maybe I can send this as a mail uh, in the discussion forum and you can um, just watch the whole video there. Uh, any other questions that you guys? Yeah, so like I was mentioning, the assignment, I think you guys have found the assignment. If you have not still found the assignment, please do let me know. I can uh, show where they are. I didn't find okay. Mm. 
Okay, so once you log in to your NPTEL course content uh, portal, you will have your own login ID and password. And once you log in, you will see the different lectures. Uh, please tell me if you if you are not able to find the lectures, then then I'll ask the relevant uh, team to get in touch with you. But immediately after you see those uh, lecture slides, you'll see the assignment as well. You'll also be getting a mail to your registered mail ID with the links for the week assignments. Every week when the week is open, you'll get the week assignments and you'll also get a notification saying that you have time until the end of the week to finish the assignments. So we are in week one. So your assignments for week one would be available and you can check that. And whatever we have discussed today is pretty much what um, will be covered in week one. Any other questions, clarifications that you guys want to ask? Hello, ma'am. Uh, it's a bit off the topic uh, question. Uh, actually, I wanted to ask about uh, the carbon offsetting market in India right now, regulations and its transparency. Uh, could you please enlighten about, on this? About what? Sorry. Carbon offsets program, carbon removal and everything. Okay. The transparency of the program. Yeah. And regulations, uh, particularly in sides of in India. Okay. Uh, yeah, I mean, right away, I don't have the exact statistics available, but uh, the Indian government has been actively taking a lot of measures uh, to reduce the carbon footprint overall. Even the plastic ban that recently happened was also... Uh, one of the steps towards that. But if you want me to exactly give you an, a picture about uh, with the statistics, what are exactly the programs that are happening, I can definitely make a couple of slides in the next uh, section and, and come up with that. But right now at the top of my mind, what I know is uh, there are a lot of programs running where uh, they are reducing the waste generation. They are funding a lot of projects, individual projects, as well as institutional projects for effective waste management, alternative uh, fuel resources and so on. So the recent government has also uh, supported uh, uh, development of electronic vehicles, which will again uh, help towards reducing the carbon footprint, footprint of the country. I'm, I'm not sure if that answered your question. Um, if there's anything more in specific, you can you can definitely let me know. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. So you can ask me questions, not just about the course in general, about uh, BTEC Biotech as, as a course itself, because I have a bachelor's in that and about NPTEL courses, any anything that's relevant, because this first session was just an introductory session. So it's more about us getting to know each other. I would like to ask one question, Sanjay. Uh, yeah. Is there, uh, you are working in Venomics, right? Yes. Uh, is there any venoms which has the enzyme activity entirely? Which which has enzyme acti activity or does not? No, no, you should arrest the uh, enzyme activity. Is there anything available in that? Anything the available to arrest the enzyme activity of venom? Yeah. yeah. No, 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 venom should arrest the enzyme activity completely. Ah, okay, okay. So venoms themselves are proteins. Most of them are uh, enzymatic proteins as well. So they have enzymatic activity and they act on various substrates. Uh, so there aren't any venoms that arrest the enzyme activity of other substances, but they do have an enzymatic role and they can help in, in, in uh, uh, cleaving proteins in the system, which is what they majorly do. They, they cleave uh, the physiological proteins, thereby uh, causing a lot of uh, damage to the physiological system. Uh, People are also exploring the individual uh, drug-like activity of venoms. There are a lot of drugs which includes caprofil, which is a drug available in the market, which is for uh, uh, patients with blood pressure. Uh, so some of these drugs are being explored uh, from venom to treat some of the action. But they do not arrest the enzyme acti activity of other components, but they themselves are enzymes. Okay, I, my interest of asking this question is, if you find like that, then we can uh, replace it with uh, that uh, normal biofertilizers, whatever the fertilizers we are using. Yes. Right? 
Yes. Then arrest them with the natural way. That's why. Right. Yes. Yeah. So mm -hmm. we uh, that is a possibility. We are exploring that uh, for replacing them with bio pesticides in a way that uh, they can help kill insects because many venoms also target insects, especially uh, scorpion venoms, centipede venoms, and spider venoms. These smaller uh, insects also target other uh, pests like yeah. insects. So we are exploring the possibility of using venoms to replace biofertilizers to kill the insects directly. So that is definitely a very good possibility and that's one of the applications um, of uh, genetic engineering and biotechnology itself. You're working on snakes, right? Yes, I work on snakes. Uh, is there any, any that is, I know that uh, maybe that the termites, uh, snakes will eat termites or something that way? Uh, there, there are some uh, snakes, some species of snakes that are known to feed on termites, but not not all of them. Many of them are mammalian feeders, especially the uh, yeah. snakes that bite humans and cause problems. Those are usually mammalian feeders, like they feed on rodents um, and so on. Uh, there, uh, I will not be directly sharing the slides, uh, at least that's not what I was told, but I can always check with the team and get back to you. But the video will be available. Like I said, you can type my name and there's this playlist called NPTEL um, Environmental Biotechnology. You can go to that uh, link and I think the link might also be shared with you. So you can just uh, look at those slides in those videos. Where to submit assignment? You have to submit it in the portal itself. You just uh, okay, people, please don't join in the last minute. I'm really sorry. Uh, yeah, please submit the assignment in the portal itself. You will have the option. Uh, you just have to write the answers. It's like multiple choice questions. You just have to select an answer and just press the submit button. As simple as that. Um, honeybee venom uses. Yes, there are a lot of uses. Uh, there are substances like melitin um, and um, uh, substances that cause inflammation, reduce inflammation, uh, substances with microbial action, which was found in, which are found in anti venoms. Uh, so there are possibilities of using them as antimicrobials as well. Um, that's mainly what is being explored uh, in uh, in honeybee venoms. I can definitely talk more about venoms in in one of the sessions uh, where we we talk about bio pesticides and so on. Um, and and talk a little bit more about my research if, if you guys are interested but yeah but i think that's pretty much it for today and thank you all for joining um, i really want this is my first time doing this course i really want to make this more effective and more useful for all of you so please do uh, post your questions your suggestions and comments uh, so that i can make slides accordingly depending on on what you guys would expect uh, from these discussion sessions um, ma'am, sorry, ma'am. Uh, like uh, you told, we can view this video, right? How can we view this, ma'am? Uh, yeah, I I need to check with the team exactly how they are gonna share these links with you guys. Like I I can okay. I can send the link uh, once I upload it to YouTube. Uh, maybe okay. I'll send it as a mail uh, in the discussion. Uh, I part. came back from work. Uh, like I came late, so I couldn't attend. Uh, all these contents are available on the YouTube itself, no, ma'am. Uh, I will be uploading, so whatever I, I just did in the class, I'll be uploading this whole recording on YouTube and that link I can share uh, with all of you probably through uh, the discussion mail uh, thread or something. Yeah. That so when the next uh, discussion meeting will be? It will happen uh, every week. So it's it's a 12-week 12, 12 course and, and this discussion session will be there every uh, week, the same time uh, in the same Google link. So you can all just... Uh, use the same link. You can save this link and come back every week the same time. It's between six to seven, and the session will be recorded. I'll I'll talk to the NPTEL team and see how exactly I can share the link. If we can get it through mail itself, it will be perfect. Yes, yes, yeah. So I'll definitely talk to them. This is my first time too, so I'll try I'll write to them and explore the possibility of uh, sharing the links with you guys. Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah. Thanks a lot, everyone. Thank you so much for joining. So um, I'll be pausing the recording now. Ma'am?